All right, let's do this. Cool. Hey guys, when it comes to your BMX racing and training and your performance, man, there are so many different things that you guys, you guys can focus on, right? There's like five different areas that you can focus on. You know, you, what is it that you need to focus on? Gate starts, track work, strength work, sprints, speed work, mental work. And in this video, what I wanna do is help you clarify what exactly you guys need to focus on. What do you guys need to prioritize when it comes to your BMX racing performance? Let's talk about it. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back to another Tuesday night edition of BMX Coach Live. I'm your host, three-time Olympic coach, Greg Romero. And if you guys haven't already, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel and support the channel. And that way we can go ahead and continuously support the sport. You know, our mission here at BMX Training is to help many, many guys, thousands of racers all over the world, help them thrive, experience their potential, and more importantly, sustain it. Today we have an awesome, awesome show. We're gonna talk about how to improve your training program and focus, how to prioritize your training. Because I think at the end of the day, it's hard, right? There's so many things that you need to work on, especially if you're like a beginner, a newer rider, or even if you're like the struggling expert, it's like, man, what should I focus on today? And what I wanna do by the end of this video is help you gain clarity on what exactly you guys should be focus on, focusing on. And that way you guys can get the most out of your energy, most out of the time that you have to invest in this sport. You know, when it comes to investing in this sport, most of your gains are gonna happen away from the track, believe it or not, when no one is watching. And understanding that, it'll, it'll, help, you, it'll help you take action away from the track, but more importantly, help you gain clarity on what exactly kind of act, what kind of action you should be taking more specifically. So uh, we're doing a live show. If you guys are watching this on the replay, thanks for watching it, watching it on the replay. And uh, let's check out and see what's going on in the live show. We have a community here of guys that show up regularly every week. JP, Connor Nyland, Jacob Jane says, oh man, glad you're back. I was having withdrawals last week. Yeah, man, last week, I wasn't feeling good. I'm starting to come back around and have a whole lot of energy. Um, it definitely wasn't COVID, but there was something weird that was going on that was making me really tired and fatigued. Um, and now I feel like I'm starting to come back around. Um, it's great. Andy Lim says, hello. Audrey says, hello, coach. Damien Como. Uh, let's see. Some guys from Portugal say, what's up? Club BC Cross. Uh, Chris Durham. Matt McClue. I, I, Matt, Matt, please forgive me. I can never get your last name right. It's uh, Mac Macaloo. Adriana Garzone. Hi, coach. Guys, thank you guys so much for showing up, man. It, you know, it would feel really awkward to do this live show by myself. So I'm really glad that I have some guests. And I'm really glad that you guys are here to support me. Listen, I'm here to support you guys as well. You know, let's go ahead and just dive right into the content. I think it's important here. Uh, let's see, I got some, let's see here, here we go. So training priority and focus, you know, um, let's see, I got some notes. You know, at the end of the day, when it comes to BMX, especially you guys getting involved in the sport, um, it gets overwhelming really quickly. I can recall when I first started racing BMX, you know, luckily, there was plenty of people at the track that can help me and point me in the right direction. You know, like as soon as you show up to the track and it's your first few, it's your first race or your few, first few months of racing, you're just trying to get used to the environment, get used to the stimulus, get used to um, the energy of the track, right? The racing, the signing up, the practicing, and, and there's tons of noise. There's announcing the gate starts are loud and there's people on the sidelines watching and everyone's cheering and, you know, it's a, it's a show. You guys, for the most part, BMX racers are no different than artists or athletes getting on top of the stage and performing in front of people, right? There are people watching. And so even with that component, it can be nerve wracking, right? And so, you know, when it comes to BMX pre preparation, when you guys get out to the track and you guys have a small window of opportunity 
to train, what should you be, what should you guys be doing? Because you have a very small window and you want to take advantage of that time, right? And so, you know, when it comes to let's see here, I got these awesome charts here. We'll start. We're going to start off by talking about the beginner. What should they be focusing on? And we'll go through my notes real quick on that. The intermediate to expert, and then of course the expert, right? Like if you're an expert, what should you be? What should you be focusing on, right? I think it's really important to know that because I know for me as a younger writer, you know, when back in the the 80s, it would have been certainly, it would have been super helpful for me to understand this stuff. Otherwise, you know, I'm always doing all kinds of, you know, I was all over the board when it came to my BMX training and 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 preparation, right? And and so let's see here. Um, looks like we got some guys coming into the chat. Welcome to the chat. Welcome to the live show. All right. So, man, this is really small here. So let's talk about the beginner. All right. I have this chart here. Maybe I should make this chart a little bit bigger. I'll do that right now. And if you guys are just joining, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for being patient. I really, really do appreciate that. And Let's just make this one a little bit bigger there. So here, here we have training priority for beginning to intermediate BMX racers. And if you guys could see from left to right, at the very top I have skills, technical, conditioning, strength and power, and, I can't even read my own writing, um, mental, please forgive me, mental mind state. I should probably open that up. It's for me, it's like I'm looking at a box that's literally that small, my monitor here. So the skills, tactical, conditioning, strength, power, mental mind state. Now you'll see in gold or yellow, um, you know, I have five tiers of, you know, the very bottom tier there uh, is low, low priority. And then at the very top is high priority, meaning that you're putting a lot of, a lot of volume of work. You're putting a lot of attention into it. And it's obvious I have skills on there, right? Like if you're a beginner to intermediate, skills is something that you guys should just be focusing on for the most part. Getting used to riding the bike uh, on the track, working on gates, working on the fundamentals of pumping, pedaling around turns, um, you know, navigating the track, getting comfortable with the track, right? And then of course, if, if you're probably an older rider, you know, that's a beginner to intermediate, then maybe perhaps it's, you're integrating things like manualing or even jumping, right? And so it just depends on how much you guys been riding your bike away from the track. And we'll discuss that here in a second. But you could see here, you know, for the most part, skills and tactical, you know, tactical is going to be more like, you know, focusing on racing, right? Like what's the concept of racing, right? Like getting out of the gate and pedaling as fast as you can, getting used to uh, battling and pedaling with other riders on the track, right? Probably not so much worried about passing you guys for the most part that are newer and starting out. You're just trying to survive getting around the track, right? And so, you know, for the most part, skills are important. You know, again, pumping, manualing, um, you know, jumping, turning, gate starts, just learning all the fundamental skills and going deep into each skill. You're not really focusing on a whole lot of conditioning. You're not putting a whole lot of energy into strength and power. There's no need for that just yet. And certainly the mental mind state, listen, you know, there's, there, you don't need to integrate any, any, any advanced mental mind state skills yet. I think what's going to happen is the more you start to improve on your skills, the confidence is going to help that mental mind state component, right? Um, and, and also by just working on skills, you're going to get more specific indirect conditioning. So that, that's going to work on that component. Strength and power, eh, it's not a priority. Everything that's going to happen um, through doing gate starts, through pedaling really hard, uh, you know, that's going to that's going to impose the demand of specific power uh, on the bike. Right. And so. You know, these components over to the right that are in blue are going to be developed by osmosis of working on the skills. Okay. All right. So pretty simple there. Let's bring up the next one. If you guys are finding this helpful, give me a thumbs up. If you guys are newer to the sport, you know, type in new in the chat. I would love to see who is new to, you know, beginner to intermediate, right? You guys are still fairly new. 
Okay, and here's the next one. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So we have skills, again, the five areas, skills, tactical, conditioning, strength, power, mental mind state. Now, when you move out of the beginner class and you're starting to get into the intermediate and you're, you're becoming more of a, a regular in the intermediate class and, and you're finding yourself perhaps a newly turned expert, these are the things that you guys are working on, right? You guys are still working on a higher level of skills, right? But there's more emphasis on the tactical, more emphasis on the racing aspect, right? Developing the instincts to race, getting used to racing, getting used to getting into the gate, getting used to coming out of the gate and start battling with other riders to the left and right of you. Start battling with riders into the turn. Start working on, um, you know, focusing on passing people, right? Just focusing on battling guys all the way to the finish line lap after lap, weekend after weekend. That's what you guys are doing. And then of course, you're starting to work on a little bit more conditioning because by the time you guys get to intermediate, by the time you guys turn expert, most of you guys are hungry and creating skills. So I'm, please, excuse me, creating goals rather uh, to keep progressing and moving up in the class, right? When you turn expert, now all of a sudden it's like, Man, all that success that you found in the intermediate class where you had to get your 10 wins over here in America, you have to win 10 races, please for, please correct me if I'm wrong, and, in an effort to turn expert. And then once you're expert, man, it might not be easy to win because you know, you're racing guys that are further advanced down the line. So all of a sudden, you're looking at things like conditioning. How can I get faster? How can I get more pedals in? How can I be more stronger out of the gate? So now you're starting to think about conditioning. You're starting to think about a training program. You're starting to think about doing sprints. You're starting to think about integrating strength training away from the track, right? This is the, this is the area where you know intermediates and experts, uh, newly turned experts, are starting to integrate things like, you know, getting into the gym, doing work away from the track, such as sprints, um, and then of course really really working on the tactical side. OK, again, the mental the mental mind state, not really working on anything there just yet. Right. So intermediates to experts, as you guys are getting comfortable with handling the bike, you know, there's less energy to perform more competence and confidence. You now have a foundation to work off of. Right. You have a foundation to build on. And now you could stick, take that same energy that you guys were using as a beginner to expert and start investing in other areas, such as conditioning, such as strength training, right? The better you get, the more competent that you get with your skills, the, the higher the ceiling, let me say this correctly, that's that same energy that you have, that small bit of energy that you have, you could start investing that into other buckets, right? I look at these as buckets, other buckets such as conditioning and strength and power. Cool. Let's see here. Whoops. Uh-oh. What did I do? Oh, I lost my camera on this next one. All right, now we're going to talk about the expert and what you guys should be focusing on. If you guys are watching, uh, if the experts are here, and it looks like if you guys are an expert, put an X in the in the live chat. If you're an expert, leave a comment below. Let me know what you guys are learning, and we'll let me know what you guys are finding that is helpful. If you guys are finding this helpful, let me know. All right, so training priority for a top expert, right? You went from intermediate to expert, you paid your dues, you struggled in the expert class, but you stuck with it. You became more competent with your skills, you became more competent with your tactical aspects of racing, and you're starting to come, become more, more competent with conditioning, and now you guys get to start investing and putting more time, making your preparation more strength and power and mental performance mind state heavy, right? Now look here in the middle, the gold area, right? Again, this is where you're putting a lot of emphasis. I should have, I should have notated that. The blue, you're still doing the work. You're 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 putting in the work of your skills when you go to the track. You're doing you're doing your gates. You're doing your half lap work. You're doing your your full lap work, right? You're working on the skills. You're, you guys are always working on skills. And here's the thing: the, the stronger that you get, the faster that you get. You still have to work on your skills because. 
you have to reconfigure that speed into the technical aspect. The faster you get, the faster those skills need to need to happen. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just like, you know, think of a guy, you know, let's just pretend like I'm an expert race car driver and I'm used to driving, say, I don't know, a 300 horsepower car, right? I'm just doing some local tracking. You give me a 500 horsepower car, whoa, my skills need to develop and adapt to the 500 horsepower car. So I need to relearn a lot of skills integrating a bigger engine. Same thing applies when you're working on your conditioning, when you're working on your strength and power, and you guys are more powerful on the, you know, you're power, more powerful physically, and therefore, man, when you're powerful physically, that bike can get out of control. So you have to be able to integrate that into your skills. However, your focus as an expert in the, in the gold here, or the yellow, however you want to look at this color, you're putting a lot of emphasis into your conditioning and your strength and power. That's becoming more paramount. That's where the focus is happening. You guys could start putting more emphasis into that area. Then all of a sudden, you notice that the mental mind state area, that's where you're going to need to start investing more. Because listen, when you're a top expert, all, all top experts have for the most part pretty darn good competent skills, pretty, do, pretty good competent tactical aspects to the racing. They know how to make passes. They know how to shut people down. They know how to do all the fundamental passes in the turns and, and take all the different lines they need to take, right? The inside dives, the high lows, the mid lows, the X passes. You know, at this level, I would hope that experts are starting to realize they are racing with their head and they're racing instinctively, right? And then away from the track, you guys are really focusing on fine tuning the engine, finding ways to add more horsepower, because at the end of the day, that's going to be the separator. And more importantly, working on the mental performance mind state, that's certainly going to be, that's certainly going to, going to be the difference between you guys that are operating at a higher level. Right, here we go. In, in the live chat, we have guys, Andy here. He says he's 46 to 50 expert. Um, Jeffrey says, I'm a dad of a nine-year-old intermediate. Andy Lim gives a thumbs up. Jeffrey Roden says, gives a thumbs up. Yeah, so there you guys have it. There you guys have it. Let's see here. Let me put this one up here. All right, guys, so when it comes to training priority, what you guys should be focusing on, what guy, what questions do you guys have? Any questions in the chat room, you guys that are watching live, I'm happy to talk about this for a second before we go into our Ask Coach G section. So yeah, I have all three tiers here. So at the very top, um, I don't know, you guys can't see my mouse. I don't know why I'm putting the mouse over this, but basically at the very top here, we have, again, beginner to intermediate, and you see the gold in the skills and in the tactical. If you're a beginner intermediate, you guys are just focusing on skills. You guys are just getting used to riding the bike around the track and integrating and learning all the fundamentals, right? You're not really focused. You're not too worried about conditioning. You're not worried about strength and power. You're not worried about the mental performance mind state. You guys are working on skills. You know, listen, when I was 35 years old, 10 years ago, I, I decided out of nowhere I was going to start playing adult league hockey. Well, you know, before I started playing hockey, I bought a pair of skates, just like a BMXer would buy a bike or maybe rent, rent a pair of skates or where a BMXer might rent a bike. And so I showed up to the rink and, you know, it'd be like showing up to the track. And I was like, look, I, I need to learn how to skate. So I, I started skating and, and it was really hard. I didn't know how to skate. I didn't, I, my mind couldn't understand the concept. And it's just like beginners, right? Like beginners don't understand that, you know, they have to keep their pedals level when they're going over jumps or, you know, or they need to have the outside foot down when they're going around a turn or, you know, or they have to keep... Their, their knees and their elbows bent when they're pumping and staying loose, right? And, and beginners are, are, you know, they're just getting used to the fundamentals and it's really hard because I, I remember, it's been a long, long time since I was a beginner as a BMXer. And when I, when I was a beginner, beginning BMXer, I actually rode my bike a lot before I even started racing. I was, I was a neighborhood rat that was racing my bike 
amongst other kids in the neighborhood. Just I just by osmosis, I was already sprinting all over town. And so, you know, when it came to ice hockey, I had to learn how to skate forward. I had to learn how to stop. I had to learn how to take turns properly. I had to learn how to, then from there, I had to learn how to handle the stick, right? So in, in the case of a BMXer, it's one thing learning how to ride the bike and learning the fundamental skills to navigate the track. Now, all of a sudden, you have to integrate that with other guys on the gate and start racing. So you have to learn the tactical side. So when it came to ice hockey, I had to learn how to handle the puck with a stick, right? And that was really awkward. And then once I, I learned the fundamentals of skating, the fundamentals of stick handling, I had to learn how I had to learn how to play the game and learn how to play that game with other guys that were learning how to play the game. And so, yeah, so from there, I wasn't worried about conditioning in ice hockey. I wasn't worried about strength and power. I wasn't worried about, you know, and don't, and don't get me wrong. I got good when I got, when I, you know, after a couple of seasons, I got good really quick. I learned quickly and I dedicated a lot of time, but I started integrating strength training. I started working on conditioning, started doing interval work, right? And, that, and, and I ended up becoming, you know, one of the better players on all the teams I played in, in adult league hockey. However, I focused on the foundation of skills. I focused on learning the game and playing the game the right way. And then again, just like the middle part here, once you learned the skills, once you learn the concept of the game, then you can go ahead and start investing in the buckets of conditioning, in the buckets of strength and conditioning and, and uh, strength and power. And, and man, you know, once, once you're in that, once you're there, it's awesome because it's like, okay, everything's clicking, right? And then from there, when you get to the expert level, your skills, your tactical, you know, it's just like walking, all that stuff is happening automatically, right? You could do it without thinking. And therefore, you can go ahead and start taking that energy that you once were investing with learning the skills and learning racing. You can start investing in conditioning. You can start investing in strength and power. You guys can start taking time and going to the gym and working on your, on your strength, working on your explosiveness. That way you guys can keep progressing. You guys can keep spiraling up. You guys can keep creating goals and keep progressing because that's what at the end of the day that's the thing when it comes to sport if you guys are not progressing the sport gets old for you you, it gets boring you lose your purpose you're going through the same motion and all of a sudden you're finding yourself quitting it happens all right so we have some questions coming in (laughs) chris durham breaks are important on ice absolutely Jacob James, okay, you got some questions. Cool. I'm going to answer that in the Ask Coach G section here in a minute. Jeffrey Roden, he asked, we are, he says, we are in, I I can't even say it. I'm, I'm rushing here. Jeffrey Roden, he says, we are in Mississippi and there's not a ton of access to good coaching. Any thoughts on how to help him with his skills, videos, etc.? I didn't grow up in the BMX world. Yes, you know, at the end of the day, there's, you know, first and foremost, there's there's some videos here on the channel at, at here on BMX Training. Also, I have the bmxtraining.com website. But I would say at the end of the day, what you want to do is, when it comes to your skills, take a piece of paper, you know, write things down like gate starts, manualing, pumping, well, pumping, then manualing, and then perhaps jumping, right? Turning, sprinting. Write down, write down all those skills and maybe perhaps on a scale of one to five, grade all of those. And then what you want to do is start focusing on ones that are weak, right? Ones that are low, ones that need to be addressed. There's plenty of information out there. There's plenty of riders to model. And certainly here on the channel at BMX Training, if it's something that has to do with manualing, well, I have a manual video. If it has something to do with gate starts, we have gate start videos. And if you guys want to go a little bit further than that and need some coaching, you guys can go check out bmxtraining.com. I pretty much have every single skill on there, and we go over we go every, we go over every single skill um, easily and effortlessly, talking about the fundamentals, and it's it's very very easy for you guys to integrate. So, um, yeah. Let's see here. 
Rocco PM 777, any suggestions for keeping kids interested in wanting to go to the track when all they want to do is play with their Star Wars to toys? Okay. Um, yeah, you know, that's a tough one, right? Sometimes perhaps you just bring the Star Wars toys in the car when you head into the track. You know, that's tough. I honestly, I didn't really have the distraction of toys. Um, for me as a kid, it was all about competing. It was all about the camaraderie of hanging out with other riders. And really at the end of the day, it's, it's all about, you know, finding a team, right? Just getting involved with a team, getting involved where your riders, um, your kids, you know, are in you know, are in the same community of, as other kids, right? Like maybe perhaps, you know, they're easily influenced with what, with what other kids are doing. And so maybe perhaps you might want to work on teaming up with other riders. That's what I'm thinking. Other than that, you know, it's tough, right? Like at the end of the day, then you need to decide, you know, ask the hard questions, you know, for what purpose are we racing BMX? You know, you know, maybe perhaps you incentivize them and it's tough, right? Like you don't want to force them to, to race their bike in an effort to get the toys and play with them. You know, they, uh, naturally they should, you know, out of their own heart, their own desire, they should want to race their bikes. They should want to go to the track. And so, you know, maybe perhaps you need to figure out and ask them for what purpose do you want to race? For what purpose do you want to ride your bike at the track? ask them, find out what those things are, find out what those values are, and then, you know, remind them that, you know, remind them of that before you head to the track. That's a tough one though. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Marius says, whoa, made it to, made it to the live stream for the first time. Good day from Sydney. Hey, good day, mate. Hope everything is well in Sydney. You guys are you guys are experiencing your summer, aren't you? Let's see here. All right, any any questions as it pertains to um, prioritizing your focus when it comes to training, right? When it comes to working on your skills, when it comes to working on your tactical, right? Like when you go to the track, you guys ha need to have a plan, right? When you guys are away from the track and you want to start training, you need to have a plan. What am I working on? Okay. And so hopefully having the, this chart here from beginner, from beginner to intermediate, from intermediate to expert to the seasoned expert, you guys should now know what you guys should be investing your focus on. All right. Looks like we have quite a few questions, which I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to be your coach and answer. I'll, I'll take a look at some of these questions, keep asking your questions, and we'll address those here right after the break. Hey guys, I have a question. What would it do for you if you could enhance your power out of the gate, enhance your sprint speed down the first straight, enhance your skills, enhance your mental performance mind state? What would that do for your racing or your kids racing? If you're seeing the value of enhancing your BMX performance, consider joining the community of BMX Training Pro and get the same access my Olympic athletes have enjoyed, as well as thousands of BMXers all over the world. Some members use the access to improve their gate start techniques. Some also use the access to keep them motivated to train. And you'll find your reason when you gain access and join BMX Training Pro today. Stay focused, get ready now. For real, get ready now. Nitro with the nice flow. Stay focused, get ready now. For real, get ready now. Let's go. Stay focused, hear the heat come. Concentrate to the sound of the beat drum. Start it up, take it back now. Check, check it out. This is how it's going down. Yeah. All right, guys, welcome back. And it looks like we have a ton of questions, which I'm really, really, really grateful for. Um, let's see, we have one coming from Trenton Moore, uh, Jacob James, Jeffrey Roden, um, Chris Durham. 
Hot Rod BMX. Hey, Andy, it's Sanders. Oh, okay. He's talking to someone else with him in chat. <laughs> All right. So um, let's go with Jacob James here. He says, your opinion on gate cadence for box sprint reaction. Save the cadence for the track instead. Yeah, I, I would say at the end of the day, Jacob, you have to ask for what purpose are you integrating a cadence with your box sprints? If you're, if you're using it in an effort to work on your reaction, then why not, right? Um, if you're using a box sprint, like I have, a, clin I have a, a, a client right now in my Winter Circle mentorship program where we're, work we're taking four weeks, reconfiguring his gate start, stripping it down to the fundamental level. He's a top level expert in the 17 to 20 expert class. And basically what we're doing is we're, we're basically doing a renovation, just like tear, tearing down a house all the way down to the studs and we're gonna rebuild it from the ground up. And right now we're, we're doing box sprints, but we're not even going 100% off that. So, and he was doing it with a cadence. I was like, dude, lose the cadence because if you're doing, if you're trying to reconfigure your acceleration technique using a box sprint and you're, in, and you're using a cadence, then you're only defaulting back to some of the bad habits that you already have. And so, it just depends. For what purpose do you want to use a cadence while using a box sprint? Now, if you're using it just straight up to improve reaction, I have no problems with that. However, there's other ways you can improve your reaction just by simply doing plyometrics. Like, why not work on the power specificity of reaction? Why not work on reaction power? Okay. I would say with a box sprint, it's more of an exercise for you guys to integrate and configure your acceleration position. For me, that's that's what it's for. It's a tool to do just that. And then yes, when you go out to the track, then that's when you know you integrate everything that you know that you already mastered, that you already been working on. And then you're just focusing on timing. You're focusing on executing, right? Presupposing that you're a top level expert, that's what I would be doing. Let's see here. Trenton Moore says, in what ways can I improve, maintain confidence after struggling and underperforming at a race? Well, I would say first off, Trenton, man, you have to be easy on yourself, right? Like, I think it's important when you struggled at a race, what's the feedback? I would identify, like literally take a piece of paper and, you know, draw a line in the middle at the very top. What did you do correctly? Man, you guys got to give yourself credit, man. Like, man, it's, so funny, I was, I've was i been watching this Netflix uh, special called Rhythm and Flow, and it's basically a competition of these up and coming rappers that are going through these rounds. And basically there was this girl that was super talented, but if she made one mistake, man, it ruined her, ruined her and crushed her. And she would just beat herself up. She would have her head down, she would, she would really, really focus on that one millisecond mistake like she forgot a verse, five minute, five minute verse, and she forgot two words and it ruined her. And the judges were like, man, keep your head up. Like, don't be so down on yourself. And so I'm not saying that you're being down on yourself, but I would say at the end of the day, my point is you have to look at all the good. Look at all the good that you did because certainly you're going to do a lot more good than you did bad. We tend to take that little bit of bad that we did or unresourcefulness that we did or what we look as failure and we tend to make that clutter the the picture of 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 your entire work right your entire day of racing so what i would do i would certainly um give your unconscious mind credit and list all the things that you did well and then figure out like what are the, some of the things that you need to improve on now, here's the thing, those things that you need to improve on, again, that's just feedback, right? That's, it, it, it doesn't really paint who you are as a racer. So that's how I would approach it in an effort to, you know, work on your confidence, right? Because you start focusing on what's bad, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, our unconscious minds, they, they tend to focus on things that, we're always looking for things that are wrong, right? And then we tend to think, you know, in terms of how we perform. And then we believe that's who we are. And I think that's bullshit. Please forgive my language, but I think it's bullshit. And so you guys have to give your, your self-talk has to be good. And it starts with identifying what you did right. Parents that are watching this, 
you know, awesome ways to, and, and please forgive me, I, I digress, if to in an effort to liberate your kids, in an effort to get them to grow, when it comes to your communication, you know, if you know they had a bad lap, you don't need to get on their case about it. I would, I would say, hey, man, good effort. You did this right. You did this right. What else did you do right? Okay, and let them answer and then ask them, what do you think that you can improve on? And that way they're not identifying with the bad and believing and programming themselves to believe that what they did bad is something that they identify with, right? And so anyways, I think it's important that, you know, in an effort to work on your confidence, right? Because, you know, that's what you asked, Trenton. That's what you asked. Um, I think that's key. You know, that's, and, and really, that's fun. That's very fundamental. Like when it comes to higher level of racing, you know, some of my top clients in my winter circle mentorship program, we have, you know, we have a couple of presuppositions here. Number one, no such thing as failure, only feedback. Number two, listen, it, it, what we do is we focus in getting into our state. We have, we have, we're, we have the ability to have emotional IQ, emotional and behavior flexibility to where we are not really worried about the past. We're focused on the present moment and what's right in front of us. And so therefore, what's right in front of us that we can control, we, we, we do this by knowing our outcome and then understanding what state we need to be, who do we need to be to go after that thing that we want, to go after the outcome that we want, to go after the result that we want. That's higher level of thinking, right? We're always focusing on moving towards something rather than away from something. Hopefully that helps. David D, positive reinforcement, absolutely. Okay, here we go. Going back to um, training priority and focus, we have one coming in from Marius. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to pronounce your last name, Marius. Marius Kazlaskas. He asked, how should how should priorities should how should priorities look for someone who used to be expert but is returning after a 15 year old 15 year break? Great question. Um, certainly what you want to do is you need to start reconfiguring your skills and the fundamental of skills on the track, right? Get used to performing on the skills. Number two, conditioning. Because I think at the end of the day, when you're coming back, you're going to find that you don't have the specificity when it comes to conditioning, right? The skills are going to come back up. They're going to repercolate and, and you're going to have that epiphany and be like, oh, wow, okay, it's coming back. And you're going to find that, oh man, I'm really tired doing this. So Working on conditioning, number one. Working on skills, number two, right? And then, of course, just getting back into race shape simply by racing. That's how I would do it. Thank you so much for the question, Marius, and thank you so much for showing up to your first live event here. Chris Durham says, I have a problem with bending my knees on the gate to balance, which puts me out of position to get out of the gate smoothly. How can I correct? Is it just practice mental and physical? Okay, so yeah, so, you know, I'd have to see how you're bending the knees. I would say at the end of the day, what you want to focus on is pushing the hips back. And as you push your hips back, have a little slight bend in the knee. If you're just standing up above the bike when you first get on and you just bend the knees, then it's kind of awkward. But the more you push your hips back, then you're going to have a little bit more balance between the fore and aft of the, of the cockpit, okay? Number two, I would say the, 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 the easiest way for you to work on your balance is simply working on balancing at home, working on balancing up, uh, up against a wall, you know, maybe perhaps not in the living room, but maybe in the garage or maybe up against a curb in front of the house if you have one. And just focus on, you know, getting that front wheel up there and balancing, balancing for 5, 10, 15 seconds. Just try to hold it. And, you know, the key with balancing is having your core tight and, and having your focus down the center uh, center line of the bike and having your 
your elbows and your knees be really relaxed, but for the most part be dynamic and be able to adjust left to right. Hopefully that helps, Chris. Thank you so much for showing up and thank you so much for the question. Here we go, Jeffrey wrote in. He says, his kid gets nervous in the turns when there's a crowd. Is there any advice for how to push through a tight crowd in the turns? Great question. I would say there's a couple things I would need to go through that I would ask as a coach. Number one, how is this turning technique, right? Are you guys working on your turning technique? Do you have the fundamentals down? Is he performing and executing the turning technique effortlessly and easily and without thinking? Has he mastered it? Number two, if he's getting nervous around other riders that are in the turns, maybe ask him for what purpose are you getting nervous? And, you know, you need to get into his model of the world and find out what it is. Is it crashing? Is it getting past? Okay. Now, you know, maybe crashing means getting hurt. Maybe Maybe crashing means he's, you know, he doesn't want to lose, lose out on a position. He wants to finish the race. We don't know. But there's an easier way to do that. And I would say away from the track in a bicycle friendly safe area in a parking lot on flat ground, I would set up a couple cones and have them do figure eights. Okay. And then the next thing I would do is if you can run along with him. Like you don't need to be going really fast on flat ground doing figure eights. Let's see, I don't have any videos for that, but what you want to do is run along with him going into the corners and just get on the inside of him and just maybe tap his elbow or even use your hand and tap his elbow. You don't need to shove him. Just give him a tap. Just get him used to, you know, having a little bit of contact while he's executing the fundamentals of the turn, executing the the turning technique. Maybe one corner, you 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 know, you you touch him on the elbow with your elbow, or maybe you touch him on his hip. Get him used to um, absorbing contact in the in the corners. When he's used to that, maybe perhaps you invite another rider to do the exercise with him, and then they pack they practice just simply bumping while they're doing corners. Another exercise that that's very popular amongst you know. Uh, clinics that are more like camps where they're doing long days of of coaching is they play a game called foot down where they create this this tight square or circle and you know they put maybe 10 riders in the circle and they, they put everyone on flat pedals and then they you, they get everyone to make contact and try to force someone off their bike they put their foot down then they're out last man standing wins now i think that's cool i think that's fun and I would say at the end of the day, I would I would even consider doing the figure eight with another rider. Maybe perhaps hire another uh, another rider, or you know just you know find ways to get it done. Hire a coach, get another rider to do it. You could work with him if you're the parent. There's many ways to do it. I would say you got to get him used to getting contact while turning. And then I would say the last thing you need to focus on, Jeffrey. I would tell your kid is that at the end of the day, when you enter a corner, you want to focus on where you want to exit and where you want to be. I think that's really important. Sometimes we get into the corner and then we just kind of focus on too much of what's going on immediately within the vicinity of, you know, the first, you know, our bubble of, of like a foot diameter circle, including the front. And at the end of the day, you know, if, if I can recall, my goal is as soon as I'm getting in the corner, I'm thinking where I want to be and what position I want to be on the exit. And I want to be focusing on that and getting there. You'd be surprised if you just integrate that part, that will be so much helpful for the rider to just be, that will help him with being confident. That'll help him with a focus of where he wants to go as opposed to where he doesn't want to go, which is the ground. And at the same time, um, that would get him away and away from thinking about crashing. Thank you very much. And let's see, Mary says the pronunciation was very good or pretty good. Um, let's see here. Huh. Jeffrey says it's crashing. I just asked him, huh? He's right here with me watching. Jeffrey, what's your son's name? Let's 
Let's see, what are the questions we have? JP, if we we're working on skills outside the track, how long should we be? I, man, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I sound like I'm messed up, but I have to like, you guys forget like nouns and verbs in, in your sentences, so I have to correct them. So JP says, if we are working on skills outside, away from the track, how long should he be, how long should be the session? Oh, it's me, please forgive me. <laughs> how long should be our session? Example, sprints. Okay, so, you know, it depends. You know, when it comes to sprints, I think the thing is, is that, you know, how much time do you have, right? Because I, I would say when it comes to any kind of uh, specific power configuration, um, acceleration position, technical session, such as a sprint session, it just depends on what kind of sprints, right? I mean, is it a technical session? Is it a power development session? Is it, um, is it an interval session? What kind of sprints, first and foremost? Let's just presuppose that you're going after more power development, then, you know, you know, you're going to need some warm up time. So, you know, warm up time is going to be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. And then, you know, maybe a half hour. So a half hour worth of sprints with like a three minute rest in between sprints. Again, de depends on how long you're sprinting. The longer that you sprint, the more rest you're going to need. Because if you're working on power, you're going to need more rest to restore ATP energy, right? You're going to need more rest in between sets because it's all about it's all about executing at a higher level. If you're not executing on a higher level, then you're reprogramming yourself to perform at a lower level. Hopefully that makes sense. And JP, I know you know this. I'm just, I'm talking to everybody that's watching, right? We want to educate everyone that's watching at the same time. But yeah, like a sprint session to me, 45 minutes to an hour for most kids, for most people, that's more than enough. Sprint sessions are, you know, sprinting is very repetitive and can it can be very boring for the most part. So there's no need to go out there and do it, certainly not do a two hour sprint session. You're, you're gonna get sick of it. It's just not sustainable. And so, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, you can get a lot done. I think you can go very deep into a session like that. Um, and that's about all you need at the end of the day. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. We got 12 minutes. JP says, thanks for your an answer. Jeffrey Roden says his son is Noah. What's up, Noah? Thanks for showing up. I would say at the end of the day, you know, like Noah has the fear of crashing in terms. I know what that's like. Again, number one, I would focus on your technique, dude. Focus on your technique. Okay. And that way you're not second guessing it. Number two, I would focus on lines. Focus on inside lines, middle lines, rail lines. I would focus on passing lines, your inside dive your mid-low, your high-low. Master the technique, master the lines. Secondly, I would focus on, um, I would focus on doing flat ground turns, figure eight turns away from the track. Get more repetitions. You wanna make this your strength, man, because turns are like one third of the race. It's 33% of the race. And that's where most passes happen. And actually that's where a lot of, pa that's where a lot of crashes happen. Uh, not that I'm trying to get you to focus on that, and I think at the end of the day, what you want to focus on is being a master of your craft when it comes to turning. You want to be the guy in your mind that believes that you have the best technique, that you can execute lines better than anyone, that you can get through the turn faster than anyone and with more confidence. Lastly, you want to get a partner that will help you, maybe get your father, Jeffrey, to, uh, maybe, maybe you call him Jeff, I don't know, maybe call him dad, get dad to help you with getting contact um, while doing figure eight turns. So when you're going through the turn, get him to touch on your elbow, right? Maybe he touches your, your shoulder. Maybe he takes his elbow and, and, and touches your hip a little bit. Get, get used to getting contact. But at the same time, when you're doing these turns, you want to be looking for the exit of the turn, okay? You don't want to be focusing on what's going on right next to you. Keep looking ahead. That's what's going to get you out of trouble. Looking for the exit, looking for where you want to end up, and getting there as fast as you can. If you could do that, then that's giving you no time to think about being discouraged about crashing. Does that make sense? If you find that helpful, Jeffrey, Noah, give me a thumbs up. David D says, new coach here of 20 plus or minus team, bomb squad BMX team. 
all different age ages and classes just starting to put together a program for team training dude that's right i think it's awesome are you doing the team training together or separately craig martin has a question for his 10 year old my 10 year old wants to learn to jump i know the I know he probably won't use it on the track for a couple years, but I think it will help bike skills. Do you agree? And what's a good way to start? Yeah, I think jumping for the for the most part, that's a big reason why we start racing BMX. We see people jumping, we see the pros jumping, and man, as a 10-year-old kid, I can recall, I used to have to jump as a 10-year-old kid, by the way. I'll tell you that here in a minute, but you wanna jump, it's fun, and yes, it's going to be helpful and at the same time, it, it will give you more confidence as a bike rider because it gives you more options, right? And so what's the best way to start? I would say work on bunny hopping, number one. You could do that at home, right? You're, you're already riding with flat pedals as a 10-year-old. So work on getting a preload, right? Bending at the hips and knees and the elbows and yank on that front end and then pop the rear wheel off the ground and then focusing on you know you know landing both wheels at the same time or landing back wheel to front wheel that's something you have to do on flat ground now when it comes to jumping um an easy there's there's two ways to do it okay i'm going to give you two options number one you could just find a tabletop right final tape find a tabletop there's my tabletop and you just kind of send it from over here. See my thumb? You just come over here, just jump as far as you can. Really safe and easy way to do it. Another way that you could easily deliberately um, work on a jumping technique is actually over a roller. Okay, let's see if I can create a roller with my fist. Uh, something like that, something like that. And then what you wanna do is, what you wanna do is just simply come up to the roller really slowly and like a bunny hop technique, pull off the lip and get the get the rear get the front end up, get the rear end off the ground, and just dive the bike back into the backside of that roller. You you don't have to be going fast, okay? And you can just do little jumps like that. Now, here's the benefit of doing something like that. That's going to teach a kid how to pump even more aggressively, right? Ten year olds, you're you're right. They they there there's not much demand for them to jump. From time to time, there will be a demand for them. And I think it's best that he starts working on jumping now. And that way, when you guys do travel, if you do travel and go to a new track and you do find there's a jump where other 10-year-olds or 11-year-olds are jumping it, he's going to have to pull that trick out of his bag. So absolutely, I think it's, it's super beneficial for him to start working on that now and developing that now as a skill. I remember when I was 10 years old, man, we used to have jumps that were literally... They were like this. They were really short, but they they were really steep. And each roller was like a peak like that. They they weren't so you know, um, they weren't so smoothed out and refined like they are today. Like you know, with normal rollers like that. But you know, back then it was more like that. It was like the video game called Excite Bike. Shout out to Excite Bike. Does anyone remember Excite Bike? But basically, it was like you know, peaks like that, right? And they were they were short enough to where a 10 year old, like younger kids had to jump it. We were going fast enough. Today, it's not so much like that. And I remember like, I remember one time we were traveling to Washington and I was going to a, an ABA, a, USA BMX used to be called ABA, Amer American Bicycle Association. So I was going to an ABA rodeo event. You're probably like, what's ABA rodeo event? Well, I. I came up with the term rodeo event. Basically, that's when the USA BMX uh, rents out an equestrian center and they build a track out of the existing dirt. So I just called it, you know, an ABA rodeo. And you'll, you'll hear it from time to time. I actually came up with that term. I'm not sure if uh, USA BMX liked me saying that, but I thought it was funny. I, I, when I was traveling in an airplane, I remember being in an airplane and I was looking out the window and I was just daydreaming like, and just praying to the gods like, Dude, I hope there isn't a pair of doubles where other riders are able to jump it and I can't jump it. I hope I'm not going to be, I used to, as a 10 year old, I used to be scared of, of going to new tracks because there was always a jump that we had to jump and it was always hard. 
you know, today, not so much, you know, the jumps are a little bit more mellower. Right. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I would say you definitely work on bunny hopping at home and working on jumping tabletops. And then of course, going slow over rollers and just work on that, that deliberate deliberateness of pulling off the lip and then nose diving back into the backside. That's going to teach you how to, um, what I call a, you know, what do we call it? They, they call it a floating technique, right? In my BMX racing skills DVD, we talk about the floating technique where, you know, you, you kind of do this where, you know, you have to, younger riders have to float. You, it's not like a, for the most part, they have to float the jump, right? They're not doing anything crazy. They do have to catch a little bit of air and they have to get the front end down into the backside of the jumps. Whereas, you know, pros and older experts that are going faster, you know, floating technique might not be the technique. They have to do something more advanced, like a tap, a tap manual or, or a push through where they, their front end actually goes subterranean, even below the landing of the jump. And then the last minute they pull it, they pull up and then they, they, they beautifully glide over the backside of the jump. What that little, what, what your kid can do just by going slow over a roller is that he could learn how to do that deliberate picking up on the front end, kind of floating it, and then, you know, getting the front end back down deliberately into the backside of the jump so he can he can continuously create more momentum. Jeffrey Roden says, Excite Bike on Nintendo was amazing for its time. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, right? Uh, Jeffrey asked, last question, will you post a copy of this chat? Absolutely, it will. YouTube will index it. I don't know how long it will take, but you should see it probably as early as an hour after this show and you will see it. JP says, I love that game. Jacobs asks, is there a different style of jumps between the ABA and the NBL? Yeah, I would say today, I don't know, not so much, but certainly back yesterday, when I mean yesterday, I'm talking like you know, since the inception of the NBL and the ABA, when they really developed and really got going in the late 80s and certainly in, in the 90s, um, the ABA seemed to be a little bit more technical. Um, and then, you know, the NBL tracks, they, you know, the NBL was all based upon tracks that were actually uh, located at public parks. So these tracks that were at public parks were actually open all the time 24 7 for the most part some of them were fenced off but for the most part you know like the traditional south park track in pittsburgh pennsylvania that that track is open in a public park and so and that's probably not a good example but for the most part these tracks they they were very much more smoothed out they were bigger and faster but they weren't as technical All right, Jeffrey Roden says, thank you so much for speaking directly to Noah. You're welcome, no problem. If you guys find any value, check out bmxtraining.com. Uh, let's see here. Any other questions? Let's see here. I'm going to move up the chat. Um, someone talked about a fresh park gate. Let's see. Rocco PM777 says, we purchased the fresh park gate, however... Seven-year-old has difficulty pulling back to hit the pedal to drop the front end of the gate. Yep. Is the rock back at gate start correct form or is it just something to operate the gate and a negative? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, man. I man, Don't get me started. And I think you're about to trigger me here. So let me get a, a sip of water. Rocco, first and foremost, yes, I am not... A big advocate of trigger gates where you have to pull back as your first movement really at the end of the day your first movement should be moving your head and shoulders forward simultaneously extending through the front leg hip and knee and ankle joint okay and so what happens is when you're pulling backwards that tends to be your first movement and at the end of the day that's counterintuitive so yes i i i personally do not like that. Uh, I think it's 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 certainly a a price point for someone like Fresh Park to sell a trigger gates. Now, don't get me wrong. Back in the day, 
Now, when I mean back in the day, prior to 2007, the random gate start came, came about in 2007. Before that, the gate was predictable. We knew exactly when it was going to drop every time. So back then, we were able to kind of, what should I say, anticipate the gate and pull back, create a little bit, a little bit of momentum, and then time it and slingshot ourselves out of the gate. Now, today, that's counterintuitive. We can't really do that because if you were to do that, you know, you hear the first horn and the gates are dropping so fast, you, you it goes beep, 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 you pull back and the gate drops, look where you're at, you're, you're way behind. And so the first movement needs to be, the first movement's important, especially on reaction, right? You need to come out with the gate. So the problem with the trigger gate is that it teaches them this one. So what's gonna happen is for the most part, when he goes to the track, when the gate drops, unconsciously, he's going to do this, right? And he's going to be, his front wheel's going to be off the gate. We want his front wheel to be on the gate when it drops. So what you could, what you could do is you can modify that gate. I know cat eye, is it, is it cat eye? No, it's not cat eye. Please forgive me. Um, something cat, and, and I'm embarrassed because I know the guys, they've been texting me lately. They're actually coming out with the gate, but they make an they make a an aftermarket upgrade for the Fresh Park, where you could uh, integrate. <laughs> you can integrate a magnet, um, and 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 you could you could do starts without having to pull back. Danny Booby says, "Let's be honest, jump the gate." <laughs> yeah, heck yeah, man, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, man, you know, back in the day, the gates used to be a lot lower, so jumping the gate was a lot easier. Can't do that anymore. Um, let's see here. <laughs> Yellow cat. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for supporting me, man. You guys got my back. Craig Martin says, thanks coach. Loved excite bike. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Well, cool guys. Um, any, any, any further questions, man? I think this was very helpful. Um, again, man, it's great to be back. I was feeling a little bit down and out last week. I was really low on energy. Um, it certainly feels good to be back. Guys, what do you guys want to learn next week? What do you guys want to talk about next week? What can I teach you? Let me know in the comments below. And I think we're going to wrap this up. All right. Well, guys, if you guys found any value, um, you know, listen, if you guys can share this video, again, my mission is to help out as many BMXers as possible, especially newer and younger riders of our sport. The more they learn, the more they have fun they're going to stick around the sport longer, right? And that used to be a, 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 a problem where, you know, we couldn't retain a member for a long time. So if we can help out more people, more people in the sport is better. It's exciting to show up to the track when there's more people. And at the same time, if you guys have found any value and, and you find this helpful and you guys want to support yourself and, and learn more, check out bmxtraining.com. Check out my membership website. There's more that you guys can go uh, into and learn more and develop. Uh, and I would certainly welcome you guys to show up there. I'd be grateful for the opportunity. Guys, I am grateful for the opportunity to be your coach. Leave me, leave me some comments below what you guys want to learn next week. And I'll see you guys next week. You guys have a good rest of your day and an awesome week. Keep training, keep working hard, and I'll be rooting for you. <laughs>